November 1st, 2017 for the Education, Environment, and Sustainability Committee meeting. Welcome, everybody. Can we have a roll call? Calling the roll, Ms. Simon? Here. Ms. Brown? Present. Mr. Jones? Here. Mr. Schron? Mr. Schron is absent. Mr. Brady? Here. There is a quorum. Also, like the record to reflect that Councilman Miller is in attendance. Thank you, Madam Clerk. And do we have any public comment related um, to the agenda? Yes, Madam Chair. Uh, first is Allison Grant. Grant. Okay, just go to the microphone. Is oh, it on? Hello. Yeah. Good. <laughs> um, I just took a few notes today. I don't know if any of you had a chance to catch the um, program on, um, it's called 1A on NPR with Joshua Johnson. Um, and one of the segments was an hour's worth of discussion on plastics. I just wanted to relay a couple of things that um, I learned from that program. Um, <coughs> One is that um, one of the guests was um, the uh, CEO and president of an organization called Orb Media that collaborated with the University of Minnesota to do a study that looked at tap water. And they, um, they sampled tap water in 14 countries on five continents. And of the samples that they had, 80% um, tested positive for plastic fibers. I, I was just sh shocked when I heard that. Um, and also, um, uh, Molly Bingham, who's the um, president and CEO of this media company, said that when she, before she started, before their group started the study, she had a theory, she had a kind of a working um, thought that um, <clears throat> the um, underdeveloped countries would have a higher incidence of plastic in their water because they didn't have the infrastructure that we have in this country to clean water. And the study dashed that theory. It found that the, the, um, the rate of plastic pollution in our tap water in this country and other developed countries was higher than in um, a lot of undeveloped countries. I just, um, I'm so much in support of Sonny Simon's um, Ordinance, um, I think it's a start to, uh, you know, trying to change the way we um, deal with, you know, packaging and, and, and the way we deal with all the plastic in our environment. I think the ordinance has um, t paid attention to some of the um, potential drawbacks, you know, of the legislation, which I don't think, I actually don't think they are there, but I think that you've, you know, the provisions that um, provide free bags to um, people that may not have money to buy reusable bags um, and other provisions that have, you know, um, looked at it in a holistic way, I think makes this a good piece of legislation. I hope you give serious thought to supporting it. Thank you. Thank you, Stacy. And um, just for the record, um, Councilman Dale Miller is a co-sponsor. Okay. So, so he's on there. Thank you. Uh, next is Michael M. Hello, I want to speak in favor of the uh, plastic bag resolution as well. Can you just give your name, please? Michael Molampi. I'm a resident of Berea, Ohio. And uh, I think the evidence that plastic in our environment has become a problem is abundant now. We just start, have to start taking effective steps towards changing our behavior, and I believe this ordinance is one such step. So I, I fully support it. We have alternatives, and I think this ordinance will begin to move us towards uh, more environmentally and health-oriented um, alternatives to plastic bags. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Stephanie Spear. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm Stephanie Spear. I'm a resident of Moreland Hills. Um, I'm here today to formally endorse the single-use 10-cent bag fee proposed by Councilwoman Sunny Simon and the Cuyahoga County Council. 
I find the proposed legislation to be well thought out, including the exemption for people on food stamps in stores under 7,000 square feet, as well as the distribution of the money raised um, via the 10, C 10 cent bag fee. Um, I've been impressed over the years with the sustainability initiatives with the City of Cleveland as well as Cuyahoga County, um, but there's clearly a lot more work to be done. Um, you may be aware of the ranking by the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, a United Nations effort to promote sustainable development, which evaluated the sustainability of America's most populous cities, ranking Cleveland at the bottom of the list, number 99 out of 100 cities. Clearly, this is not how we want our region to be recognized. The report not only shows that we have a long way to go when it comes to protecting our environment, but also shows how failing to address sustainability goals can impact our economy as companies are looking for progressive green cities to call their home. As David Beach has been touting for decades, we want to be a green city on a blue lake. We want an image of a clean city, not one where plastic is clogging our rivers and lakes and contributing to the 5.5 million pounds of plastic pollution that contaminates Lake Erie each year. As we all know, Lake Erie is one of our greatest resources, but it contains the second most plastic pollution of all the Great Lakes. Single-use carry-out bags pollute the environment, contributing to more than 269,000 tons of pollution in the world's water, much of which is consumed by fish and other wildlife, finding its way into the food chain. Plastic bags not only have an average useful life of 12 minutes, but do, not biodegrade for, but do not biodegrade for hundreds of years. By the year 2050, the ocean will contain more plastic by weight than fish. By 2050, 99% of seabirds will have eaten plastic. I'm privy through my thir nearly 30 years of publishing environmental news to the issues that matter to people, and plastic pollution is top of mind for many. I'm confident the people of Cuyahoga County want this single-use bag fee, and I'm grateful for the hard work of Sonny Simon for introducing this legislation. I know this legislation is opposed by the plastics industry whose sole purpose is to make money off these plastic bags, and they're putting a lot of pressure on this council to reject the proposal. But I'd hope that members in this committee, as well as the Cuyahoga County Council as a whole, will see past this distraction and vote for the bag fee, which is, the best, which is in the best interest of people, planet, and the economy of Northeast Ohio. More than 200 states and local governments throughout the United States have implemented a fee or disposal bags or completely banned plastic bags, including Seattle, Austin, Eugene, Honolulu, Aspen, Chicago, Montgomery County, and Maryland, and San Francisco. I hope we will be adding Cuyahoga County, Ohio, to the list this year. Thank you for listening. Thank, thank you. And what's your publication, Stephanie? Um, I'm the founder of EcoWatch. Okay. International publication started here. Um, if anybody um, did not sign in, if they want to make a comment, do so now. Um, you'll have a chance to speak if you want at the, the end as well, but you'll need to sign in. Next is Susan S. Susan S. I do have a last name, it's just a tough one. It's Susan Stuckshelly, and I thank you so much uh, for letting us speak today. Um, I was here a couple weeks ago when um, Sonny brought in, through the satellite uh, presentation, uh, Dr. Mason, who, did, who really started all the examination of the microfibers in Lake Erie, starting with Lake Superior, and st did the study. So this is just a continuation of that work. And today I also um, was lucky enough to hear that presentation on NPR, and I, I was blown away. He, you know, I went home last time, and I said to my husband, okay, no more plastics. And we already try to recycle, and we try to use our regular grocery store bags, but I probably have a my own pile right there. And so I've been trying to think about all the different ways we have plastic. Every time you go to a restaurant and you take home that little bit of food that you throw out, you usually have it in plastic. It is everywhere. And as um, they said so succinctly last, last time, 70% of our body is water, 
and all of that plastic breaks down and breaks down and breaks down into those little tiny fibers, and we are drinking it. It's in our water, and we can't get it out unless you have a super filter, and we don't even have that at our processing plants. I ran off six articles just today after listening to the NPR, and a lot of these referred, were referred to during that program. And, but I'll just say very briefly, because I know they're, I'll hear a ding in about two seconds. Um, Rwanda, the country of Rwanda has, that was just in the New York Times on Sunday. They have made it illegal. Kenya, so all these countries are realizing, first of all, it's terrible for tourism if you go to those countries, and it is what we eat, and it is what we breathe. It's in mother's milk. It is shocking. So if, if, you, if you don't care about the environment, if you worry about the 10 cents, if you worry about the retailers getting on your back, think about yourself, think about your children or your grandchildren drinking every single day water that is contaminated with plastic. And it, those are endocrine disruptors. They are really affecting our um, ability to procreate, our ability, I mean, they're cancer-causing. So I, I beg of you to please consider this means. And as I said last two weeks ago, there were some people that had some objections, like somebody might go to Lorain County to get their groceries rather than here in our own county. These are small things. We can deal with these issues. You know, we're a smart city, we're trying to renovate our downtown and the, the suburbs, let's go for this. This is only a win-win for everybody. And if you want to see any of these articles, I'll be happy to share them with you. Thank you. Good timing. <laughs> Next. Next is Nina McClellan. My name is Nina McClellan. I live in Shaker Heights. Um, I was here for one of the prior um, sessions, and uh, it just brought home what an important and urgent uh, issue this is. So I urge the council, please, to pass this. And what worries me is the pressure that uh, and the bad publicity or information that may be put out by the industry, and so I think that's a challenge, and I hope that you will rise to the occasion and do the right thing in this case. So as a parent and grandparent, please, uh, let's take a first this important first step, and thank you, uh, Sonny Simon, for taking the lead on it. And Dale Miller. Next is Gail Long. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Gail Long, and I'm a constituent of Councilwoman Brown. Um, I want to express my support for the resolution or the legislation, I'm sorry, and hope that it will eventually lead toward the banning of uh, plastic bags altogether. Uh, I had an aunt that died two years ago at the age of 105, and 40 years ago when she was living in Newark, California, she was making her own canvas bags and making sure that we had them. So I've been trying to do this, to do the right thing for the last 40 years. My daughter lives in San Francisco, and... Uh, somebody actually stole those bags that my aunt made out of her grocery cart in a grocery store. So, I mean, people got used to it out there, and um, you're used to paying, you know, the 10 cents if you don't have a bag with you, and um, it's definitely worth it, and I would hope that there would be some way to make sure that the... Um, the reusable bags are um, available to families at little or no cost um, in the legislation. So again, I support it and hope it leads towards complete banning. Thank you. Next is Kent Whitley. Good afternoon. My name is Kent Whitley. I'm the Environmental Injustice and Climate Chairman for the NAACP, and I'm here because we have uh, we support this uh, bag issue, uh, this resolution rather that Sonny Simon has put together with Representative Dale Miller. Uh, our main concern is 
we feel that there's a strategy to solve all of these problems. In the city of Cleveland, we have a lead-based paint problem. There's a strategy put in place to try to solve these problems. There is also, in the Cleveland Public Schools, there's a water problem with lead in the water. There's a strategy to try to solve these problems. I would hope that this body can come up with a strategy, which Sunny has come up with, I take that back, the strategy that she's come up with to try to solve this problem with the bags. The NAACP uh, is very concerned about poison in the food. Fish, poison, lead-based paint, poison. When we talk about our children, our children are being poisoned, Mr. Vice President. In your community, our children are being poisoned. Let's come up with a strategy to solve this. Let's pass this legislation. The NAACP is very, very concerned. I would also like to say that this is not a tax to you guys. This is not a tax. This is a fee. If you're poor and you can't afford it, there will be bags provided. This is not going to burden our community. Okay, is that understood? This is not a tax. The, the opposition is coming out and saying that this is a tax. And most importantly, we think that this will create new jobs and provide specific work, workforce training for our community. I uh, hope I'm not going over the time. I'll be short and sweet. Thank you very much. That was the last speaker. I'd also like the record to reflect that uh, Council and Baker is in attendance. Thank you. Okay, so we have minutes from October 25th and um, hope we had a chance to look at those minutes. Do I have a motion to approve the minutes? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, minutes approved. We have two pieces of legislation um, referred to committee and both of which we're gonna be looking to um, move to the full council for second reading suspension. The first of which is 2017-0185. Can you read that please, Madam Clerk? Resolution number 2017-0185, authorizing the county executives to execute a non-binding joint statement to address the noise impact of the county airport. Thank you. I can speak to this. This is um, actually a resolution adopting a non-binding noise abatement um, agreement that um, is going to be approved by a noise abatement council that consists of the cities of Richmond Heights, Highland Heights, and the county. And this council was formed just to address the noise issues surrounding the airport. Um, in those communities and they've worked really hard um, in their meetings to come up with this um, agreement or this resolution and have asked that the council approve it so that at least um, with regard to the county that it is official. Any questions? Okay. Move to adopt. Move to adopt. Second. So I'm going to ask that this be um, Move to the full council for second reading suspension. So, all in favor? Aye. Aye. No opposed. Next item is 2017-0191, Madam Clerk. Resolution number 2017-0191, authorizing a cooperative agreement with Cleveland Cuyahoga County Port Authority in order to make certain agreements to share the interest rate subsidy to be paid by the United States with respect to interest paid on not to exceed $2,775,000 of revenue bonds issued by the Port Authority. Okay, do we have someone to speak to this? Mr. Director Foley and Mr. Price. Uh, thank you, Councilwoman. Uh, Mike Foley from the Department of Sustainability. Um, uh, I'm going to bring up uh, Dick Pace, who's with the project. Uh, this is in relationship to uh, qualified energy conservation bonds that the county has through the um, stimulus uh, program um, from the Obama administration. Seven or eight years ago, the county was allocated almost $9 million worth of qualified energy conservation bonds, which can be used to help projects um, reduce the cost of energy conservation measures, basically. So, um, you know, uh, it'll be for, could be for lighting, you know, efficient lighting, efficient uh, furnaces, cooling systems, um, you know, window treatments, things like that. We as, a, we as the county have, have had this allocation, but we've never used it. We've made it available to folks, but it's just never been used before. Um, so this will be the first kind of time we've, we've been able to use it. Um, Mr. Price, uh, Dick Pace, uh, Pr uh, Pace, I'm sorry, from um, uh, uh, Harborview Pro Projects is going to talk about it a little bit. But basically, we would be allowing um, 
our 2.75 million of the of our allocation to be used by the port to then be used for the project, we will not be putting any money out for this project. We will be getting money back in return uh, because of the way this, the, these federal bonds work. So over, I think, about a 15-year period, um, we will be sharing the subsidy that will be coming to the project. We'll be getting about $450,000 over a 15-year period that um, we would uh, also be able to use for future energy projects uh, for, for the county um, and, and county projects. At least the, the legislation is drafted at least the first five years, uh, the money coming in would be used to help us with our climate uh, uh, or uh, sustainability plan, which we passed uh, last week, the county passed last week. So uh, projects that come through the sustainability plan that we think are important. So with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Mr. Pace and he can talk about the project real quick. Uh, thank you, Mike. Uh, my name again is Dick Pace. My company is Cumberland Development, and we were uh, blessed to be uh, the developers for our North Coast Harbor and the lakefront uh, by the city of Cleveland. Uh, this is our second building within the project. The first was uh, Nuevo Restaurant, which is at the end of East 9th Street uh, next to where uh, Captain Franks used to be. So that we opened up last year. This is the second, second project that we're working on. Uh, we have a, a presentation that I'll go through quickly. Um, this is a, a rendering of the uh, project when it will be totally built out. You'll see uh, a number of aspects to it. Um, th the, there are four sites. Site A is where the Nuevo restaurant currently is. We opened up that last year. Uh, they, they have uh, served more than 150,000 people uh, since last year and 25,000 people in special event space. So it's been a huge success uh, summer and winter. They, ex they exceeded expectations in the winter. Uh, site B is the site that we're currently talking about and I'll come back to in more detail. That's a uh, mixed use site, three story building with the top two floors as residential, the first floor is uh, office, retail, and parking. Site C will connect the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame to the Science Center and to the Science Center parking garage so people in February can get to the Rock Hall from their, par from their car without having to go outside. It'll also add more retail uh, to the area. And Site D is 18 acres north of the stadium, which uh, was uh, originally built for the Port Authority. Uh, it now will be a vibrant mixed-use neighborhood. So all this is part of our master plan. Uh, the master plan uh, shows uh, all the development on the 18 acres and those three buildings that I mentioned. Uh, this was the first, the uh, Nuevo Restaurant, two-story building out on the pier of East 9th Street next to Voinovich Park. Uh, this is the site for Site B. This, uh, this is uh, what we're calling Harbor Verandas, which is right next to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame on what used to be a skate park. Uh, this is a rendering of what the building will look like. Uh, Three-story building, top two floors, residential. Uh, we have a long-term lease on the project. The city owns this land, and the city's charter pro prohibits them from selling lakefront property. So we have a 50-year lease with a 47-year option. Um, so these will be apartments on the upper floors, two and three bedroom apartments uh, with very large outdoor verandas. The smallest veranda is 10 foot by 15 foot outdoor spaces it's like having an outdoor room. Uh, so we, we think that the market really will want to be out on those verandas looking at, the, at the, these great views. So the site is a very tight site. It's a half an acre site and we're building basically uh, our entire site, but we're also improving uh, the boardwalk, which is public uh, access easement, and uh, we're adding more trees. Uh, we're creating better uh, site furniture, better site lighting. Uh, all that is part of our project uh, without tapping on the uh, city's uh, resources to do that. This is the first floor with uh, parking in the center and then surrounded by retail so you don't see the parking for uh, this project. It's hidden in the middle of the building, uh, but we'll have uh, 29 parking spaces for 16 units, so uh, uh, a nice ratio of parking to, to residential units. And then the upper floor, as you can see, the recesses uh, that are, are uh, hatch lines, those are those outdoor verandas. Are very large. Some of the verandas are 10 feet by 20 feet. One you can see is very large, probably 800 square feet. So uh, very nice units. Every unit has a water view. Uh, every unit uh, has 
the uh, passive solar shading from these outdoor verandas and the covers over each of the verandas. And this is another view looking back towards Nuevo in the, in the distance uh, right next to the transient marina. And that's the last slide. So uh, in a nutshell, uh, we, we want this project to be uh, a sustainable, environmentally sensitive project. Uh, we're geared towards uh, LEED Gold uh, certification. Uh, with that, we obviously are going to have a very tight and energy efficient enclosure for the building. Uh, with windows and uh, uh, the exterior wall, with exterior roof, uh, to make sure that we have a very energy efficient building. We also will have 100% LED lighting. Uh, we won't have any incandescent lighting. We'll have very efficient HVAC units for each, uh, each unit. Uh, we are relying a lot on natural lighting through uh, the building. We actually have skylights in the, in the roof to bring natural light to the corridor on the second floor and then openings between the second and uh, uh, third floor to bring natural light to uh, both floors. Uh, all the appliances will be Ener Energy Star and we're considering solar panels on the roof. So the entire project is really geared towards uh, the environmental sensibilities. Uh, we did the same at Nuevo, uh, and we, that's, that's the way we want to develop the lakefront. Um, so with that, we are uh, doing bond issues through the Port Authority, and uh, two bond issues, and the second bond issue uh, is this uh, energy uh, efficient uh, the, uh, bond issue for qualified energy conservation bonds. And if there are any questions for that, we have Ryan Kozak here from Huntington Bank, who is an expert in those uh, types of bonds. I am not. He's trying to teach me along the way. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you. Any questions, council members? Uh, yes, uh, Mr. President. Thank you very much. This is a quite interesting project. Um, what, is the, um, what is the time sensitivity on, on this legislation? Um, it's the first time I've heard any presentation sure. about it, and uh, it has um, a lot going for it. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, you know, I'm not sure uh, what the intentions of the chair or or what the intention or what the expectations you know are of the port or of the administration because uh, no one has spoken to me about this. Um, I apologize that we haven't communicated better. Oh, no, I don't better, mean it but, that way. Um, I'm glad, I'm glad to, to see it in front of us. Don't take me wrong. Certainly. Uh, Art, just to give you a clarification on our timeline, we uh, uh, have started construction already. If you go down 9th Street, you'll see that uh, we're already drilling uh, auger cast piles for the foundation. We're doing deep foundations going down 92 feet for the uh, to get to the bedrock. Um, so we've started construction. We do not yet have financing. This is an important piece of our financing package. So to us, it is an urgent time, uh, time issue to try to get financing right now. I'm writing all the checks out of my, uh, my account to cover the contractors uh, because we want to have this open for uh, a year from now so that people can be living on the lakefront in August of, of 18. Some Director outside. Foley, I think there's some time sensitivity with regard to the bonds, but is there not? Go ahead. Madam oh, Chairperson, okay. just so there's some clarification for me, because um, there were four elements uh, here that were on the screen, and uh, is this are we are we on, are this is this exclusively about the residential uh, property? Uh, because that's not the impression I had from. Well, I, I was uh, I, I showed those earlier slides to give you a context. We were, we're looking at what we call Site B, which was on that. No, I, I know which one it is. Oh, okay. Saying. So that's exclusively what this is about. Correct. The, the, the restaurant's already been financed. Uh, we're a year into it. This is uh, financing is just for this building, not for C or D. And how many residential units are there? 16 residential units, eight on each floor and then uh, 7,000 square feet of, of uh, retail and office space. Will they be paying property taxes? Yes. Uh, we, we will have a, uh, uh, the, uh, by rights with the city, uh, the residential will have a uh, 15-year abatement. The office and retail will be paying taxes. We're cur currently paying res uh, the taxes. Um, so that, yes, there will be, we have been paying taxes into the city or into the county, and uh, we will continue to do that. They will increase as we build our building. 
uh, but the residential portion will be abated for the 15 years. And what is the approximate um, cost of one of the residential units? Well, the, the total project is about a $12 million dollar sizes, project. Right? The, uh, the residential units are, will be apartments because we cannot sell them. I'd love to, if they were condos, they'd already be pre right, pre-sold. I understand. So, so what, what will be the approximate uh, rent, rental? Rent, rent will be about $2.25 a square foot. Um, Can you extrapolate that out for me? Sure. So the units are 1,700 square feet for a two-bedroom unit with a two-bedroom plus an extra room for an office or entertainment. Uh, the three bedrooms are about 2,000 square feet. So they'll be $3,800 uh, a month to uh, a little bit over $4,000, um, depending on, on the units. So that puts it at the top of the market, not the most expensive units in downtown Flats East Bank. Right? But, but at the top of the market. But uh, we want to be at the top, but not the top, and that's where we're, we're sitting right now. All right. Well, it's also setting on an awful lot of public subsidies that have been, that have been uh, spent on the, on the lakefront over the last 30 years as well. Um, Mike? Uh, just in terms of timing, just one consideration above and beyond that is that so we've had these bonds for since 2009. We really have tried to use them as much as possible. We've offered them for low-income housing projects, um, tax credit uh, deals that uh, have been applied for that haven't won. Um, there is concern that these are going to be swept at some point, that these bonds are going to be swept. And especially with the tax discussions going on at the federal level, these may, uh, if there's ways to pull dollars uh, away to, you know, to pay for tax cuts, you know, other tax cuts. This is a consideration that we're concerned about. So. Madam Chairperson, just to finish up, um, um, I'm willing to support this legislation, uh, and um, I think it's uh, creative and that it, it'll be good for the, the lakefront in downtown Cleveland. I just want to remind not you folks, because this isn't, this is not where it's uh, directed, but it was only about 10 days ago or two weeks ago that we had a room full of people about housing issues. And there was some discussion about high-end housing and about uh, the, the need and desire for some resources from this, from this county for housing issues. And uh, some of the discussion at that time was um, about, um, uh, well, let's just say, um, um, the fact that most of the housing uh, uh, development that's gone on has been high-end housing. Uh, I'm not against high-end housing, but I want to uh, make it uh, uh, clear um, that um, um, this, kind of, this kind of housing is certainly not the kind of housing that we had uh, people representing 40 different groups uh, in front of us 10 days or 15 days ago asking for a few million dollars from the county budget in this biennial. And so I just have to say that, and uh, beyond that, I'm willing to support the legislation. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Councilman Brown. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I understand you said this project is already underway? Yes, it is. We've started uh, the foundation work already so that we could meet our schedule to be open in the summer and not open in the dead of winter. Okay. And um, is it possible you can give us a breakdown of the uh, minority and diversity inclusion participation on the project? Certainly. So we have uh, signed a community benefits agreement with the city, which is for the entire pro uh, development of the lakefront, all four pieces. And each piece we have uh, reaffirmed that through our lease. So we have um, uh, a number of components that uh, uh, I'm trying to, I, I don't want to misstate the percentages, but they are the standard percentages that the city has requested for. Uh, minority participation, female uh, business enterprise, uh, and local residents. We meet the uh, Fannie Lewis uh, requirements for residency and low income residency on the project. That's one category within the uh, uh, community benefits agreement. We're also, we offered uh, Chris Warren when we were negotiating the deal to add a component for education. Uh, so we are working with the uh, STEM school, the CMSD STEM school that's at the Science Center and providing ongoing education, uh, uh, integrating the, those students into the project uh, through this next year through construction. So um, those are all components of, of the project. We also have those requirements uh, for MBE, FBE through the port, by, by working with the Port Authority. They have their own set and we, 
exceeded those, I believe, uh, with what we had agreed to with the city. And I apologize for not knowing the percentages offhand. I, I could guess, but I, I don't want to say the wrong thing. Understood. You, um, I, I somehow didn't get the total cost of the project. I missed that. Uh, $12 million project cost. The construction cost is less than that. Okay, thank you. Jones and then Miller. Councilman Jones. And, and as the council president said, this was our, our first time seeing it. When And the project is underway. Was, was the county at the table from the beginning of the project or... Uh, what was the need, uh, for, if not, what was the need for bringing us in at this moment? Um, the, I have not come to the county for a subsidy or support on, on the, I didn't for the restaurant, and actually for the restaurant, we didn't ask for a subsidy or support from the city either, that uh, these are, are good development projects and we, we did not need that there. If, with the restaurant, we had a first mortgage from Chemical Bank and a second mortgage through Greater Cleveland Partnership but through, through CDA um, to fill the gap that, that exists between uh, the mortgage and, the, and the, our equity in the project. Um, I, we thought that would be the, the configuration of the financing for this project as well. Um, in late spring, we were told by uh, Greater Cleveland Partnership that they were not participating in this, so we had to fill that gap. That's when working with Huntington Bank, they had the solution of using the, the, the energy efficient financing uh, package, which I was not aware of until then. Uh, and we were d doing lead gold anyway, so it made sense to us to, to meet those requirements. So that was uh, when this unfolded. So we, we actually had no plans on coming to this uh, county for support. We don't plan on the future projects necessarily needing support from the county. Um, I certainly would welcome it, but uh, on this one, we need it because of the the energy efficient bonds that we're we're issuing. So it's a it's a new newer piece for us. It was not our original intent. What is the payment repayment schedule for the for the bond? Uh, if Ryan, I can ask Ryan Kozak from Huntington Bank maybe to, to help help me out on the on the facts. Mm -hmm. So the re. Mr. Vice President, uh, repayment over 15 years. 15 years. Uh, this is Ryan Kozak. Huntington. From Huntington. And that was 2.7 million? Correct. Okay. And I just want to reiterate, we're, we're not putting anything out. This is a, um, a federal uh, program that was created. It was uh, $180 million was given to the state. I think this, the, um, we uh, were offered an allocation of about $9 million of the uh, um, but it's, we're not putting any money out. We're actually getting money out of it. And I really am concerned about, you know, we really have tried to use these things. They're complicated to use. They're, you know, they're costly to use. So you, you need, you know, uh, bond council. Uh, it's, it's not like you can use these on a high $500,000 projects. They've got to be on projects that are, are pretty, you know, um, pretty expensive, to be honest with you, because um, they're costly. And so uh, um, we really have tried to use them. And, and this is kind of the first project that has been bankable, I think, and uh, has won kind of an award, uh, you know, it hasn't lost an award from, from uh, tax credit financing at the state. So. And Mike, did I hear you say that um, these bonds, we could lose them if we don't use them over time? Yeah, there's a concern. So they've, they've been in existence since 2009, 2010, um, and we just haven't used them in the county. I mean, we've figured out other ways to finance programs, but because of their kind of complications, we haven't used them. Um, there is a fear that with uh, kind of changes in the federal government and, and the administration and trying to pay for tax cuts, right, that, uh, that money that has not been used on these, you know, for these purposes so far will be swept up and not available to counties anymore or to, to uh, entities that haven't used them. Yeah. So could we're you, worried that both, they'll be swept up. Could you send us the list of, uh, you mentioned the number, $180 million in it was something These like at the bonds. state, yeah, for the, the and we get an allocation of about eight point nine million. How much of those do the? Uh, how much of that money does the county have left? And is there a timetable for use? So we were allocated eight point nine million. We still have eight point nine million available. We haven't used it yet. So, okay. um, and that's the and the question is, will they be swept up? There's no timetable t that automatically, if you don't use them by X date, they're going to go away. But there's a lot of discussion, especially among the kind of, um, tax credit finance people who are, who are paying attention to this stuff, that because of the, um, 
tax changes that are potentially coming down the pike that this these dollars may be swept up. And my last question, Madam Chair, give us a sense of the uh, broad use of these. Is it strictly downtown, like this, or describe the can be used potential for use? So they were, um, um, they, were, they were made available for local governments to do work on their own properties. Uh, um, you could expand the definition of how they're used so they can be used for any project in the community as long as it's doing energy conservation measures. So it's, you know, it could be renewable power, it could be, you know, what, what the project's doing here. So it could be, as long as it's energy related and it's, say, and it's for, um, you know, things that save energy or reduce consumption of energy, then that, that's what the, the projects are, that's and, what the dollars done can be used for. on county property. Please. You say, and it has to be done on county property. Own has property? to be within right in our in Cuyahoga County. Has to be done within the geography of within Cuyahoga geography County. Of yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, if I understood you right, uh, Director Foley, you said eight point nine million is available through Cuyahoga County, and we're looking to um, provide this project two point eight, pretty much. Yeah, two point seven five. Okay, and so according to the um, legislation, the, the county shall endeavor to spend the subsidy it receives be in years 2018 to 22. So is that not true of the 8.9, or is that specifically for this dollar amount? So that's for the subsidy that comes. So we're splitting the subsidy, mm -hmm. and so that's that $450,000 that I talked about that the county will be receiving. So there's a subsidy basically that is paid back to the county issuing these bonds, um, or to the entity issuing this bond, which is us. So we'll be getting $450,000 roughly over 15 years. I think it's like 35000 a year roughly for We'll X take it. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and um, we just passed the sustainability plan, um, and we're looking at climate change action type activity. So at least I, uh, I was hoping <laughs> the way we wrote this, at least for the first five years, that the money, the 35000 coming back in for the, at least the first five years could be used to help with the climate change and uh, action plan or sustainability plan that we just uh, that that you guys just passed a couple weeks ago. So. And I guess the other the follow up question is um, the the qualified energy conservation um, initiatives that are are set forth. Is it a list that is um, available to the to the developer and who approves whether or not they meet those requirements as listed? If there is in fact a list. You're talking about the measures in the property, like the you know, that would uh, yeah. that would en en enable them enable them to receive this grant yeah, or so, uh, bond. I'm sorry, bond. Right. So it's yeah. So there is um, you know by federal regulation, there's a list that is a, that says you can use the the resources for these things, right? So it could be for solar panels. It could be for you know um, you know high efficiency furnaces or windows or you know, uh, uh, chillers, things like that. So there's a list of things that as long as they conserve energy and reduce consumption uh, and reduce greenhouse gases, then, then they're eligible to be used and, and paid for by the, by the resources. Okay, and who and is there an approval process? I mean, I, Councilman Jones could essentially say, "I'm going to build a property and make sure all these things are in place." Is there some follow up? Who, in fact, determines whether you have met those requirements or met the initiatives that you propose to receive this, the funding? I'm not, I, uh, since this is the first time we've done this, <laughs> so I'm not exactly sure how the approval process works or the mechanisms of it, but. Um, you, so you apply, you do something, you apply to um, uh, basically the uh, federal government and say, this, we think this is eligible, an eligible activity to be compensated for um, by these things. They will check off and say, yep, that works. Uh, no, 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 that's, you know, you can't put a, uh, a coal-fired boiler in your basement. That doesn't work, you know, things like that. So, uh, But it's got to be, so there's, it has to meet the checklist that, that is eligible for, uh, to be paid back or, or kind of be checked off and said, yeah, this, this we, we'll give you the resource for that. Okay. Right? Thank, uh, thank you. That, that's correct. We, we have uh, provided a list and the, for the values of each of the components I mentioned, um, specific list, and part of that, uh, the, what is required is for a qualified uh, uh, license engineer or architect to sign off on that, that, that we do meet those requirements, and that has been done. And we can provide that list of, of the qualified <clears throat> components that have uh, met the requirements of the statute. But it's not something that we do at the county. It's, it's something done at the uh, right. federal level. So, Councilman Miller. <clears throat> Madam Chair, my uh, 
My question is about uh, development site C, which uh, looks to be the long-discussed uh, pedestrian bridge. And my, my question is, uh, am I correct about that? And if so, uh, what is your folks' role in that project, and what is the status? Uh, yes, so uh, if we go up. It, uh, So yes, that site you can see in this drawing. We show the with the the uh, pedestrian bridge uh, with that loop. Uh, that was uh, the configuration from the Rosales Bridge. We coordinated and uh, sat in stakeholder meetings with uh, Rosales and with the county uh, back when that was active. Uh, so that would land on. We have a, a one-acre uh, area that is leased uh, by us from the city, uh, which is that site. We had, uh, so we, we had never entered into an agreement with the county or the city uh, for the landing of the bridge, but we, we are advocates for better connections back, so it's in our interest. So we were willing to coordinate uh, with that. Uh, my assumption is that the bridge is in the process of changing. Uh, design because of the, the cost, uh, cost of the bridge versus the funds available for it. I'm not a participant in that right now. Um, I have thoughts and, and suggestions as to what the best way of doing that is. Uh, we, are, we still stand open to using that site for the landing of the bridge if that's the best option. So I'm not sure if that answers your question. It does, and we would certainly uh, be all ears and open to any suggestion because that uh, that project has been on the drawing board without uh, without positive movement for a long time now. Councilman Jones. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you know, I'm actually, uh, the project is an excellent project uh, from what we've been presented, and uh, it's certainly one I can support. Um, but what has amazed me today is just learning that there's $8.9 million for uh, for uh, environmental and sustainability projects. The, the first question that comes to my mind is, why didn't we use these for the solar panels that we've just, that we, we've discussed? Why not, and this is before you, but I'll throw it out there, for, for this very building, a LEED certified building. And I'm just hearing about this money for the first time. What, can you tell us why not, on the, at least on the solar projects, which, which was in your, your purview at the time? For the um, the solar panel the, the Brooklyn landfill project, that's correct. Yeah, so we're able to because um, we're not borrowing money for that. We're we are so we're doing a prepaid power purchase agreement for the solar panels out there. So we are prepaying for electricity for for ten years and using that as the construction basis for um, for building the project. So we don't we're not borrowing money. Okay. Um, we're going back further before you, but I'll throw it out there. It, it was not used for this building itself, and that, and I don't know. <laughs> okay, and yeah. the money was available since 2010. Yeah, 2009, 2010, right? Okay, um, and I, I I just can't speak to it. I, I don't know. I, and I, I look, and I, when I came in, I I, I got to tell you, I didn't know what they were. <laughs> I never heard of them before. We kind of figured oh. them out, like you know, uh, oh, way through our first year, and, and then we started we did, we did start shopping them around, seeing if if you know. We talked to municipalities, talked to you know mayors and managers association. We talked to um, kind of the nonprofit housing developers, and um, you know, the, and, and some other project developments that, that were taking place. And it just for one reason or another, it was just there was there was reasons that they they just weren't eligible or were kind of kicked out, or for you know whether the project wasn't financeable, whether it didn't get um, you know whether the federal the, the housing tax credit allocate you know award wasn't made. Um, or for other reasons, so it, they're, and they are difficult. They, so they're they're a little bit harder to use. They're not kind of mm -hmm. easy things that people normally know how to use. So it's a it's a little bit complicated. Uh, Huntington obviously has some expertise in knowing how to how to use these things. So well, you can uncomplicate it for us. So it's, I'm, look, I <laughs> wish I, I'm trying. So, <laughs> so uh, last question: eight point nine million was the number you mentioned. Is that before or after the two point seven for this project? So that's before. So we'll be down to six point whatever eight point nine six point two six point two. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Um, yes, and I was going to ask exactly that question, so thank you. The um, consultants that are now going to be hired to test or explore our gas emissions, is that something also that can play into this, uh, this source of money or no. maybe future plans of what you might do with that uh, study? Yeah. Uh, no, uh, Councilman Brady. So they will be. So there was a twenty thousand dollar contract that helped them do help us uh, um, measure our greenhouse gas emissions coming out of the county. So it's kind of a specialty. That, so that's not for you. Can't use this uh, source uh, for anything other than energy conservation measures. So um, as we kind of think through, you know, we, we get the um, information back and data back on, you know, um, where our greenhouse gas emissions are coming from. What are kind of the um, uh, ameliorating kind of things we need to think about in terms of climate change affecting Cuyahoga County, then potentially these will be available for project costs, but not for kind of consulting costs. Okay. Just one last question. Uh, the six point two million dollars. Um, I know you mentioned some type of timetable. Can you give me any rough sense of of when this money might not be available if if it's not used? Uh, yes, Councilman. So it's. Look, it's up in the air. There's no firm deadline when it has to be used. Okay. There's just worry that because um, um, there's money that has not been allocated yet throughout the country, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's probably hundreds of millions of dollars you know, available through these qualified energy conservation bonds that have not been utilized that the Trump administration may try to just sweep them up and not make them available anymore and use them for other for tax cuts. So. Okay. That's the worry. So. Thank you. And thanks, Director Foley, for finding this money and this opportunity that was sitting there before you got here. So if people are comfortable on the committee, um, I'm going to make a motion to move this to the full council for second reading suspension. Second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Mr. Mr. Chairman, Madam Chairman, sure. I would just like to suggest um, that... Um, the, the normal process that we've just been uh, uh, experiencing uh, will probably replicate itself uh, in front of the full council um, because this is people are interested in this sort of thing and it's uh, um, it's not something you see in front of you every day sure. and um, so um, maybe uh, a little bit of a, an, a of a a chance to try to be proactive um, with the, with the entire council uh, between now and then, uh, you know, would probably be helpful. I, I certainly would appreciate it. Um, and I also want to thank uh, uh, everybody involved and the, and the folks from the Huntington Bank. And, and um, um, I'm, you know, this is, uh, this is interesting. Point well taken, Council President. Okay, okay we'll see you at the full council then. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so at this point on the agenda, we um, will have a reading of 2017-0006, and I can talk about um, what will come next. Ordinance number 2017-0006, enacting Chapter 721 of the County Code to authorize a carryout bag fee for environmental remediation. Okay, so at this point, I want to apologize to those who um, already saw the TED Talk by um, Dr. Sherry Mason and to explain that when it was showed at the two council committee meetings ago that our uh, colleagues on the committee did not get notice through the clerk's office, um, so they weren't here to, to hear or see it. So we're going to play it now, and it's 14 minutes, and so whoever was here, feel free to go. Um, but then we're going to have a quick... Uh, presentation from Director Foley and try to get out of here by 4.30 for um, committee members. And I'll be back. Okay. Okay. I did. It's, it's good. Yeah, so. Okay, so um, can you get Purnell? Yeah, we're going to just show it again. Oh, sorry. Did you see this uh, streamed on your own? I don't know, but yeah, I'm sure we can, but we're going to show it here. Okay. I didn't know you were coming or I would have warned you. Yeah. Although part of it you haven't heard. So this is 14 minutes. Okay, yes. we're going to roll 14 minutes, and then we'll have a quick presentation from Director Foley, and then we'll try to um, get out at 4.30.
It had been 10 years, actually 16 years since I left Texas, 10 years since earning my PhD studying the influence of forest fires on the atmosphere, 10 years of living along the shores of Lake Erie, but this was my first time being out in the Great Lakes. And not only was I sailing them, but I was sailing them aboard a replica of War of 1812 tall ship the Niagara. I would be awake for 36 hours. <laughs> and possibly because of the delirium associated with being awake for so long. <laughs> um, I had a question that kept coming into my mind, like the waves striking the wooden hull of the boat. <clears throat> I kept thinking about everything that I had seen, heard, and read about plastic pollution in the oceans, the most infamous collection of which is the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. What does the middle of this garbage patch look like? Water. It just looks like water. And yet out of here, we can pull all of this. I kept wondering what we would see, what we would find, in the Great Lakes. I didn't realize it at this point in time, <laughs> but this is one of those moments in your life where you change directions. Gone was the woman from Texas who studied forest fires in Montana, <laughs> and instead I was embarking upon a new career as a plastic pollution researcher. My hope here, talking with you today, is that I could get you to reevaluate your relationship with plastic. So what exactly is plastic? The main component of plastic is a polymer. These are modeled off of naturally occurring polymers, things like our hair, our skin, our very DNA, but they're synthetic. They're made from fossil fuels. A polymer is kind of like a train, how it's composed of these individual cars that are linked together to make the bigger train. A polymer is made of individual monomers. Like for example here, I'm showing polyethylene is composed of these ethylene monomers that we link together through the polymerization process to make our polymer. But plastic isn't just the polymer. It's actually a mixture. So mixed in with the polymer, we have things like plasticizers that allow it to be molded, UV stabilizers to protect it from the sunlight, colorants so that we can have plastic in every color of the rainbow, flame retardants so they don't spontaneously combust when we use them, because that's a big concern, and other additives that also aid in its moldability. And I've used this word moldable twice because it's actually one of the features of plastic that make it so attractive from an industrial standpoint. You can make anything from a baby doll to buttons to a bottle of water all from the same material. And that makes it really unique when it comes to material science. It's also lightweight, so transporting it is quite easy. And it's durable, so it won't break down along the way. Somewhat ironically, the same product properties that make it so attractive from an industrial standpoint are a concern when it comes to the environment. It's lightweight, so it can be carried to every facet of our planet, and you find it everywhere. It's durable. It's durable because, in fact, it doesn't undergo the same um, process of decomposition that most natural materials do. It doesn't biodegrade. That is, that there are very few organisms that can use it as a food source, and so it doesn't get turned back into soil the way natural materials would. Instead, it undergoes a process called photodegradation. So as sunlight makes it more brittle and cars drive over it and the action of wind and water act on it, it'll break into smaller and smaller pieces. But the polymers, those polymers that we were talking about earlier, very little is happening in terms of them with regard to their chemistry. So even as these pieces get smaller and smaller and smaller, it's still plastic. It still isn't going away. As a material, it was originally created the dawn of the 20th century, but it wasn't until World War II that the infrastructure for the mass production of plastics took place. 
And when the war movement ended, industry turned its attention to us, to the consumer. This is an iconic 1955 Time Life magazine ad called Throwaway Living. And it's used to really mark this transition in our society from one of reusing materials to one of disposability. Just throw it away. Because after all, disposable items cut down on household chores. Why wash that cup when you can just throw it out and be done with it? Right? <laughs> yeah. But remember, this is a material that doesn't go away. Even when you throw it out, it's still there. But as a result of this transition and this marketing, you see the exponential increase in plastics production after World War II. To the point in 2014, when the most recent numbers are out, we were producing over 300 million tons of this material. This material that doesn't go away. It's all still here. All of it. Somewhere. Where is it? Sadly, increasingly, we're finding it in our water. As an area of scientific research, this really started in the world's oceans. But in 2004, a United Nations report came out that 80% of what we find in the world's oceans is coming from land. So that proverbial plastic bag you see blowing in the wind, well, it makes its way to a river, which flows to a lake, and all bodies of water flow into the ocean. So the plastic is making its way to the oceans through freshwater systems. And we live on the largest freshwater ecosystem in the entire world. People are dying for water, and it's our backyard. In 2012, we decided to do the first investigation for plastic pollution in the Great Lakes, the open waters of the Great Lakes. We started up in Lake Superior. We sailed down into Lake Huron and then into Lake Erie. The next year, 2013, we did a second expedition in Lake Erie, as well as Lake Ontario and Lake Michigan. So between the two years, I've sailed and <laughs> swam in. Um, and also have data on plastic pollution within all five of the Great Lakes. At the very beginning of the Great Lakes chain, right, Lake Superior flows into Lake Huron. And in these relatively pristine environments, we already find an average of 7,000 plastic particles per square kilometer. And remember, this material is not natural, so we should be finding nothing and we're already finding 7,000. In Lake Michigan, that count goes up to 17,000. In Lake Erie, 46,000. And the waters from Lake Erie flow into Lake Ontario. The last step in the Great Lakes chain before they flow out to the Northern Atlantic Ocean. What do we see here? A quarter of a million plastic particles per square kilometer. 230,000 plastic particles per square kilometer. This rivals the abundance that we find in the most polluted parts of the world's oceans. And this is our backyard. This is our water. The water that we are the caretakers of. But it wasn't just the sheer numbers that really shocked us. It was also the size. 75% of the plastics that we find in the Great Lakes are less than one millimeter in diameter. Incredibly tiny, like a period at the end of a sentence. They're so small that when you go out to the lake, which hopefully you will after hearing today's talk, and you look at the water, you're going to think, I don't see any plastic. You won't. They're so small that you don't see them. But they're there. And that makes them even more scary in my mind. The vast majority of these pieces of plastic are fragments 
things that broke down from something that was larger, like the kid's sand pail that gets left behind when you go out to the beach um, on a Sunday. Second to those fragments are pellets, these rounded pieces of plastic that we find in many of our consumer products, things like body washes, face washes, toothpaste. One of my uh, colleagues was telling me backstage about how he went to get his hair washed, or his hair cut, and uh, they washed it, and the shampoo had micro beads in it. So these are included in these consumer products, and they wash down the drain, and our research has established that they make their way through wastewater treatment plants and end up in our water. And then we pull them out of the great lakes. But why do we care? All right, so there's plastic in the water. Why does that matter? Well, it goes back to what I talked about at the very beginning of the presentation, where I said plastic is a mixture. Embedded within the plastic are these chemicals, plasticizers, flame retardants, and other additives that are in the plastic but are not chemically bound, and so they can leach out. As the plastic is in the water, it actually provides a really nice surface for lots of other chemicals, too. Things like PC polychlorinated biphenols, which were banned in the 1970s because of their known human health impacts, but they're still in the water. Polyaromatic hydrocarbons, which come raining down from the sky into our Great Lakes. These stick to the outside, and so the plastic actually becomes like little poison pills. And remember how small these little poison pills are. They're so incredibly tiny that they can be easily ingested by organisms at the very base of the food chain, zooplankton. And they can be carried through these organisms up the food chain and ultimately into us, carrying those chemicals all along the way. So why should we care? Because ultimately, we are water. Our planet is 70% water, our bodies are 70% water, and I don't think that's coincidence. Our skin kind of creates this illusion that somehow we are separated from our environment, but we're not. If it's in the water, it's in us. So now that I thoroughly depressed you, um, <laughs> what can we do, right? What can we do about this? What are some solutions? And ultimately, it comes back to what I asked you to do at the very beginning, or what I hope that you get out of this talk. I want us to reevaluate our relationship with single-use disposable plastics and eliminate them. And there are some really easy steps that we can do. Because ultimately, everything that we find in the water comes back to us, right? So how do we do this? How do we eliminate single-use disposable plastics? Well, you can change what you buy. So I don't know if any of you have been faced with this quandary, but this happens every time I go to the grocery store. I'm faced with the option of buying organic bananas wrapped in plastic versus conventional bananas that are not. It's a difficult decision because I like to buy organic. I do believe I vote with my money. But the reality is I can change what I buy, and I refuse to buy things that are over-packaged in plastic. I refuse it. Shake the habit of plastic bags. So you go to the grocery store. I mean, when I was a kid growing up, it was you know paper or plastic. Now there's not even an option. It's just plastic. I made a commitment to myself five years ago that I would never take another plastic bag. If that means I have to carry everything out in my arms, well, that's what I do. I'm okay with that. <laughs> um, but most of the time now, I've trained myself, right, where I remember my reusable bags and I bring them with me. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for watching. And as much as um, I can answer questions. Do we have questions from committee? No, she was here last time by Skype. And we are going to hear from Director Foley. And no, I don't have any questions. Do you have any questions? Okay.
Thanks. Uh, Mike Foley, Department of Sustainability again. Um, two, two or three quick things. Um, last week, uh, there was a question about other uh, cities, municipalities throughout the country and out the, throughout the world that have adopted either plastic ban fees or plastic ban, uh, plastic bag or single use bag uh, bans. So um, uh, actually, council staff was very helpful in putting this. Uh, map together, and there's a uh, spreadsheet, in, uh, I think on page three, and I'm not sure how to, you can, okay, okay. Um, so this is where, uh, these are cities throughout the United States that have uh, instituted either um, bans or fees, um, mostly in the coast uh, uh, and uh, kind of the west, um, Chicago, Milwaukee, uh, some places in Michigan and Iowa. Uh, we would be the first uh, place in the state of Ohio to do one. Uh, but also, I think it's interesting worldwide. There's just, you know, whole countries have adopted um, uh, bans on uh, plastic bags. Uh, I think you've heard Rhodesia, uh, Ireland, um, you know, uh, countries in Asia, South America. It's not, we're not the first place to do this, right? This is, uh, uh, it's not something that is unique to Cuyahoga County. In fact, it's becoming kind of a, I think kind of a practice uh, throughout uh, uh, progressive cities that, that are kind of thinking about the environment and, and uh, uh, their culture uh, throughout the world. Uh, secondly, and I'm, I'll just pass these out, but I, I've got a couple just, uh, there's questions about um, uh, difference between uh, paper bags and, and what the costs were, environmental costs and, and uh, economic costs in terms of uh, paper bags as a, as a um, uh, receptor to, to carry things out. And also we, we did a kind of a, just an analysis of 10 cities um, that actually kind of talked about the, just the reduction. So we did a little research and, and looked into, like a, um, I don't know, Santa Barbara, California, Portland, Maine, um, Washington, D.C., Chicago, Illinois. So there's a lot of cities that have uh, already implemented this stuff and has shown, you know, very positive and successful uh, uh, reductions in um, uh, single-use bag use, uh, um, uh, you know, usage um, and, um, and, and reduction in usage and, and has been positive for the environment. So I'll pass these out. I've got these on paper. I don't have them on uh, a PowerPoint. Thanks to staff for putting this map together. Good job. Any questions? Um, I just uh, appreciate the... Um, uh, I was looking at this... Um, right before the meeting, um, and it's, it is uh, quite quite impressive in terms of what's going on around the country and around the world. Um, I, I'm glad one of the ones that you pulled out, sorry, um, was Chicago, because naturally, um, you know, when I saw Chicago was on the list, and, and I didn't see Milwaukee, but that would be uh, interesting as well. Uh, I just, and, and Toronto, actually, but but uh, particularly Chicago, uh, given uh, the size of Chicago, so that um, you know, I, I really would be interested in the history of, and I will find this out. Um, you know, the history of how this how this played out in Chicago, how long, where, how far we are along in this process, uh, because a city uh, of about three million people, I believe, in the city proper, which is the second largest city in the country, or third, or whatever. Um, um, it seems to be a pretty good apples for apples way to, to, to look at this. Um, I've always sort of thought of Chicago as a, as a very large Cleveland and, um, and Cuyahoga County. Um, uh, but um, so, um, yeah, I'd like to take a close look at, uh, at how that, uh, at what they did in Chicago. Um, okay, and we'll, you know, they did do a seven cent fee uh, the first month. There was a reduction in 42% of 42% in the use of plastic bags. Um, I think it's been deemed a, a by and large a success. And I, I think it's become normal, right? But we'll get you some, uh, you know, if you want, we can uh, kind of do, try to find some case studies just on, on Chicago. I know the University of Chicago um, proper has done some research just on, on their, um, their fee and, and what, how it's uh, positively impacted the city. Mm -hmm. Come. Thank you. I'm, I'm looking at this, the first page. It's uh, pretty impressive when you look at the entire world, what they're doing. Uh, and help me to understand the red means that these nations Nations like, can I remember Tanzania and um, France? They they have, they have banned 
totally correct. The plastic bag use. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Mm -hmm. And the other colors are just kind of, of to a lesser degree than a national ban. They've done fees. So um, Ireland has a, a thirty. Uh, 33 cent fee, I think, uh, it was like a 22 cent euro, or 22 euro uh, or percent euro fee, something like that. But um, yeah, and I actually talked to someone uh, who was in Ireland a little while ago, and they they never saw a plastic bag the whole time they're there. They're there for a couple couple weeks. It's just not normal, and, and people get used to it, right? It's what just not they, something they, what they do think they, about. What do they use? They either bring their own bags, or you know, they they carry stuff out in their Same arms. Same thing we have here. Yeah. They're using. They use this thing. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, thank you. Looking at the global chart, am I reading this correctly that both India and China have national bans? Mm -hmm. uh, Councilman Miller, you are. That's um, that. Uh, that alone is one third of the world's population covered by that. So that's pretty significant. And they're still alive. <laughs> I see Russia has not met Madam Chair. <laughs> Russia has done nothing. China, China. is pretty compelling. Mm -hmm. China, yeah. But they're looking at your emails right now. So <laughs> <laughs> You're not allowed to have emails in China. <laughs> that's right. Mm. Maybe that's the answer. <laughs> Thank you for doing this. This is really interesting. Yeah. And your staff, the council staff, was yeah. very you know, instrumental too. So thank you. Thanks. It. So just um, 70 million people in the United States, I think, are subjected to any a bag um, fear ban in the United States. So 70 million people right now are um, surviving with with this type of um, protection. Um, and just as a quick visual, I'm going to wrap up. But um, on, on in front, I have um, three bags of plastic bags that amount to about 340, which is the, a low average of what every single person uses per year. And we know that it's unlikely that all those make their way back to garbage pails. That was a discussion we had last week. Perhaps that if we get rid of a plastic bag, that there will just be an offset of purchasing plastic garbage bags, but that's not the equation. We know that there's way more of these plastic bags that are in, in consumption and distribution that find their way into our garbage pails, where ultimately they wind up in either a landfill or our ocean or lake. So um, it's the single-use nature of this plastic that, that drives this legislation. 12 minutes usage of an item that's going to live on for 500 years. So that's really significant. This is not an attack on plastic. It's a single use, unnecessary um, items that, that are going to um, impact the next generation. So next week, we're meeting at 3 o'clock, and we're going to hear from a legislator from the state of Maryland who was um, the author of that legislation. And we'll talk about how Washington, D.C. and the state of Maryland has managed to um, implement a similar model and how it's working there with their retail and with the residents. So um, I want to thank everybody. Oh, and Diane Bickett was here and dropped off um, reusable bags for the council members. Thank you from Solid Waste. And um, just quickly, um, these are the kind of bags we're looking at giving away um, to the residents of the county. I like this one. It has farmed animals um, that are made from plastic bottles. So we will be helping um, recycle plastic and having really strong, sturdy bags for residents throughout the community. Um, so that, that's it for our presentation. I thank everybody for listening to the TED Talk, and thanks for being here. Is there any other public comment, Madam Clerk? No, Madam Chair. Okay, so we're going to um, be back next Wednesday at 3. Thank you.